welcome to another oil and gas webinar. Today, we're going to talk about material selection and specifically some challenges related to some of the business partners and clients we work with in terms of specifying and selecting materials, especially in scenarios where there's lots of complexity. Today, I'm joined by Rob Allen. Rob is an ESM with Carboline. He is based in the UK and he's got a background in mechanical engineering, about 30 years in protective coatings. Rob's done a lot of things, including work all over the world, West Africa, Caspian region, 10 years in the Middle East. And Rob's gotten involved in a lot of things, offshore construction, fireproofing, civil, subsea. Rob, sounds like you've done it all. Good to have you on to chat today, man. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me, me on today. Yeah, I've been with Carboline about 15 months now, based out the UK. Primary roles is Carboline's engineering manager for Europe. It's really to, to advance your spec position by management and developing a relationship with owners and specifiers across Europe. And at the same time, managing and delivering new construction projects, both regionally and globally. Excellent. Well, let's jump right in. Why don't we start? Can you talk to us a little bit about some emerging trends and things that you've seen when it comes to specifications and materials? Yeah, I think to, to probably to keep things a bit topical, as we see our clients' businesses evolve more and more into green technology, we're seeing what they require from a coating specification change in, in many various ways. I guess from a technology perspective, if we take carbon capture or green hydrogen, for example, we're constantly encountering new manufacturing processes, different chemicals, and ever increasing extremes of temperatures and pressures, etc. And these are really challenging current coating technology. And as a coating manufacturer, we, we have to be ready to meet that challenge. I know we're already working with some owners and, and engineering houses jointly to approach these challenges. But I mean, also at the same time as, as a technology aspect, we as a global manufacturer, we also have to consider our own carbon footprint and not only in providing our customers with more environmentally friendly systems from a VOC perspective, but also in our manufacturing and logistic processes, ensuring that we as an organization are fully aligned with our clients' aspirations. Yeah, good point. And certainly things over the last eight to 10 months that we've seen have changed a lot. You talked about energy transition and things like that. A lot of these companies that historically called themselves oil and gas companies are now referring to themselves as energy companies for a lot of the reasons you mentioned. So definitely a, a bit of a shifting landscape and some challenges, but certainly some new opportunities if you look at it that way as well. So Rob, you've been involved in your experience on capital projects, on maintenance. Let's talk about capital projects for a second. And your experience, what are maybe some of the most difficult parts of a capital project to specify coatings for? Well, I think, as you well know, at the design stage of a large capital project, more often than not, it's not always known whether the various packages from within that project will be ultimately be fabricated. If we use an example of a new build refinery in Europe, say, the engineering design may also be done in Europe. But, you know, in this day and age, it's in reality, probably the main packages of that project will actually be executed in the Far East or possibly the Middle East which means that when we are proposing the specifications, we need to be mindful that the products we specify are not only fit for purpose and commercially viable, but they also have to be readily available in the, the possible in many locations around the globe, the package will be fabricated. You know, and I'm just talking about the main fabrication packages here. When we go on to look at the supply of equipment, such as pumps, valves, piping, etc., this can be even more complex. These items can be manufactured by OEMs anywhere in the world and often come coated by using various other manufacturers' materials, which again means we need to ensure that any damage repair procedures we write into specification at the design stage are truly fit for purpose. And I think this is where the, the introduction of a global product range is really given us an advantage. Yeah, good point. I mean, it's certainly... As you mentioned, I think the bigger the projects, the more complex they get and a lot of different variables. And so to your point, before you even get to specifying the product, you got to look at logistics and the procurement teams have to understand these complexities and know how it all fits in, even down to the manufacturing level. And 
certainly a lot of moving parts when it comes to these things. So good, all good points there. Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the biggest corrosion challenges you faced and how you solved it? I think in my short time at Carboline, is that if our thirst for, for higher hydrocarbons in, in, increases and in well depths increase. And I think the latest figures I read were now drilling in depths of, of three and a half thousand metres. The subsea temperatures and pressures that we're encountering are varying and in pushing the boundaries of coating technology to its very limit. That's a real challenge. You know, if I was to use an example, one recent project that, that we worked on with a requirement for a subsea tie-in spill, which would see temperature variances from, I think it was minus 46 degrees centigrade to plus 60 degrees centigrade. You know, so, so quite a wide range. They then see quite a rapid increase in temperature up to the, the plus 60. So therefore, along with the other requirements, the usual requirements, thermal shock was a critical factor in this project. And fortunately, through a combination of track record in-house and third-party testing, we were managed to propose a system for the project. I think in that instance, we actually went with Placite 4660. But yeah, I think the ever-increasing depths in subsea development are, are causing us some real challenges. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, some of the newest finds and as, as we're still exploring as a global community all over the world, yeah, the, the depths are increasing. And great point there about how that challenges the coating systems. You mentioned something else I wanted to touch on. We're in a day and age, especially in the protective coatings community, where there's a lot of emphasis on testing. There's new test programs. There's more labs than ever that do these tests. But then you got the other side of it, which you mentioned was a key in our products being selected for the, the project you mentioned, and that's having case histories and having experience. So really what you see, as well as this convergence of this testing and real life experience. And that kind of leads into some of these real specific fit for purpose specifications. You mentioned that earlier. So can you give us an example of a fit for purpose coding recommendation? Yeah, I think one great example that's one product that's really kind of struck me in my, in my time at Carboline is the use of CarboGuard 890GF for subsea environments. For those that aren't familiar with the product, 890GF is a cycloaliphatic amine epoxy reinforced with glass flake, which we have fully tested and approved to NOSOP M501 system 7A, 7B and, and 7C. This approval, it doesn't only give the client peace of mind, but in particular, it's a great advantage to the applicator. And they only have to use one product to achieve the required protection on a particular area of a subsea asset. So it just be simply varying the dry film thicknesses of the product. They can meet the requirements of each category of System 7. You know, a real great all-round, again, you, you said it fit for purpose product. All right, Rob, well, let's switch gears for just a second and talk about passive fire protection. You obviously in your career have had a lot of experience in that area. And currently when you look at the industry, there's really two options that people have settled on, especially over the last 10 years when it comes to specifying PFP. One is cementitious, one is epoxy. So maybe talk a little bit about what place each one of those products have on projects. Yeah, well, I think that as we both know, Doug, fire protection of any oil and gas facility, onshore or offshore, can be varied and challenging, even more so with the growth in LNG and the challenges that brings. And traditionally, these requirements have dictated whether epoxy or cementitious fire protection material has been used. But, you know, at Carboline, we're in the unique position of having both epoxy and cementitious PFP within a product portfolio, which allows us to take a holistic view with clients' best interests at heart. You know, with a combined pyrocrete and thermoclad, thermolag range, we can offer our clients the most suitable, technically practical and commercially sound solution to each individual fire case, you know, which gives us them the option to select a solution that is most appropriate for them, not just what we would like to sell them. You know, one great example of this was the introduction of, of pyrocrete 341 in 2020, with which we're now able to provide a cementitious solution to scenarios that historically could only have been filled with 
epoxy technology. I'm thinking particularly about cold spill protection. Yeah, to build on that a little bit too, with that next generation cementitious, certainly when you look at the transportation piece, it's a product that continues to perform and can be put on a truck and sent out to a site and perform well there. You mentioned LNG. We certainly have a lot of good information. In fact, recently at AMP, at Bring On the Heat this year, a couple of our colleagues did a paper which really looked at the combination of two ISO standards. Essentially, there was a cryogenic spill uh, applied, and then 15 minutes later, the reaction of a fire and, of course, the product characteristics holding up well there. So a lot of good information, a lot of good uh, testing and technology coming out. And really, you know, in a scenario we're in now, in the global oil and gas community, everybody's under commercial pressure. And so I think we're looking at each of these products and really trying to build in, like we talked about, these fit for purpose solutions, particularly when it comes to fireproofing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, Rob, enjoyed having you on. We'll have another discussion at some point, but thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you here soon. Yeah, thanks, Doug.